I'm good to go whenever. So, let's see. I'll put a little emote there too to get the reaction going. Like, ooh, nice. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, other than that, are we uh, are we ready? I think we're ready. All right. Um, well, hi everybody. My name is Zach. Uh, I am currently a senior at Wichita State. Uh, my major is in media arts with an emphasis in game design, and I am going to be showing a workshop over level design. And so we're basically we'll go through the basics. It won't be this whole tangent because I, I could honestly go on all day and talk about level design. It's my passion. It's what I strive to do as an end goal for my career. And I think that this is something that will help kind of give a, a better understanding of what this specific career field does in the industry. Because I know with with Wichita State, I've noticed that there really isn't a lot of coverage with level design. There isn't a, a core class that goes over everything about it from the basic fundamentals to the end results for your final phase of what you're working on. So hopefully um, I can brush off some of my knowledge onto you and uh, you can take with that whatever you wish to do. Hopefully it inspires some people here to look into level design as a possible career. If so, awesome. But anyway, um, what is level design? What do, what do level designers do? Well, we're, we're the world designers. We're the peeps that we take an art concept and we put it into a 3D sandbox. Essentially, the best way I can describe it to you guys is we are the Bob Rosses of game design. We take a blank canvas and we create an amazing 3D world and it can be whatever it needs to be, whether it be an open world sandbox like World of Warcraft style or a linear first person shooter competitive map from Counter-Strike or Call of Duty. You know, we are the people that make the environments for the players to run around in and have fun. So how does that work, though? Like what what are the steps to to making a level like that. How, how do we how do we even start it? And so we're gonna go through that here. Um, I've got my intern expo up from when I was over at Blizzard over this last summer, working with the level design team on World of Warcraft. And I felt like this was a great example to kind of showcase the basics of the each step coming to level design. So first things first, as level designers, you're not just stuck with a 3D software you also work in adobe products like photoshop illustrator things like that and so what you're doing is your whiteboarding or your concepting phase here this is where you get your team together and you you're coming up with ideas like hey what do we want our world to look like what do we want what do we want the the theme what do we want the environment to look like the biome you might you might add is it going to be a role play experience is it going to be open world is it going to be linear? Are we going to restrict our players to certain paths? Is it going to be symmetrical um, where you're going to have a red spawn versus a blue spawn and very matching hallways or a matching cover for a, a PvP experience? Things like that. And so what you do is you open up Illustrator or Photoshop, whichever the studio uses, because each studio is different, right? Not everybody follows the same formula. And you're going to learn that as you go on and you're you're applying for different jobs for different studios, you're going to see the name, even the names of each position are different. Not everybody says level designer or art designer or modeler. They, they use other names for it. It's interesting. And so this is a concept that I actually drew up. I've been working on for a new project called the Cosmic Veil. And you'll see it's very basic. It's very rough. It's it's not detailed. It's just a very simple top-down overview of where I want certain environmental aspects to be, where I want maybe paths to go, if I want some rivers or lakes or ponds. And then around it, you'll see these different images. And these are your references. 
because you got to gather references, right? You can't just sit here and and think, oh, I know exactly what I want to do. It's in my brain. Here you go. Because not everybody is going to see what you're seeing through your brain, right? Everybody's going to have a different picture of what you're trying to describe. So that's where gathering your references is going to be very important because it gives everybody else in your team a better understanding of what you're trying to design, what your pitch is for this world. And so all these different bubbles that you see here are going to be different locations of ideas that I've had for maybe I want some cool ruins up here in this Eastern keep that I, I've thrown down. And maybe I want this really cool, this spherical portal looking cave where it's magical, it's mysterious, things like that. So again, reference gathering and concept planning, that's kind of like your, your first stage. It's, it's your, your, your first start to getting your, your level design going, getting the flow and the rhythm going. The best part about this though, is that all of this is scheduled to change. This is not set in stone final design. This isn't what it's going to look like in the same top down view. When you've done everything, you've thrown in your textures, you've made your mountains and, and whatnot. Things are set to change, and that's through consistent feedback systems. That's through maybe you just you had the idea and it was great at first, but you want to change it up a bit. Maybe it doesn't look so good when you're when you're working with it, you know. So things are always set to change, especially in the level design world. It's it's actually pretty crazy how much they change. But speaking of mountains, that's where you get into your terrain sculpting. So after you've had your your concepting and your planning. You start to get your basic shapes. You start to get your very, the rough chunks of land or terrain that you're going to be using to mold in, in the future for this project. And so something that you go through and you learn is how to terrain sculpt and how to sculpt different mountains and rivers and ravines. Think of it like clay modeling or 3D modeling in a sense but with uh, a giant paintbrush and just this massive flat piece of of pixels that you can turn into almost anything you want. And so, again, you're sculpting, you're shaping, and you're texturing this terrain that you want to envision throughout the rest of your world. And so this was an example that um, I have here. When I was working with, um, in my internship, this was one of the first things I learned was how to sculpt mountains that fit the World of Warcraft environment. And so there's three different images you have. This is your, your kind of your white out phase. This is where it's very bland, it's dirty, it's your basic shapes. It's, you know, you're kind of getting the, the rough shape and in in all the different ridge lines and the creases and everything like that, and going into your basic texturing and then your final product, which is creating that nice depth and the, the wow sort of environment and that establishing shot. Um, so that was a lot of fun to do. And once you get through that and you establish your kind of your, your basic, your, your chunks of land, you start to get into the fun bits, in my opinion. And that's making your environments. Because as level designers, you're also an environmental artist. You can go outside and you can see, maybe, maybe you walk, you're, you're in a walk in a park and you're looking around and... You, you know, everything around you from the trees bending over in this pathway to the mounds of dirt even or getting down to ground level and just watching ants or, or the grass and how everything is shaped from erosion and just naturally over time and then taking that and then throwing it into a game. That's exactly what you're doing. That's it's it's I, I don't know how else to explain it other than just taking nature at its finest and then applying it in your own vision for your own world. And creating something amazing and so this is where you learn a little bit of geology this is how you learn you know what different trees grow in different height levels or elevation points on a mountain or on a ridge etc how does dirt flow if there's a mudslide how does grass um take over in an erosion spot over time how are boulders formed from high mountains and things like that so it's things like that that the more you know the better off you're going to be when it comes to actually designing your your overall environment and making it look as realistic as possible it's not so much just making a little bump in the dirt or a bump in your terrain putting a tree at the tippy top with a couple rocks and a, and a flower and be like okay that's good it's great for maybe a block out but 
depending on what you're trying to go for, realism or not, it may not pass for it. And so yeah. this was one kind of showing off the the different areas of like where mudslides would be, how would paths be cut out from erosion and rain and dirt and soot over time, where are trees being placed, things like that. And again, this is all from an open world perspective, right? Again, this isn't this going to be the same thing if you're working, depending on what studio you're working at, because if you're working in a linear single player game, it's going to be an entirely different philosophy versus what a game company like Blizzard does with their open world MMO, right? It's, it's going to be entirely different. So essentially take, take what I'm saying and take, you know, everything that you see here with an open mind and be like, okay, again, general idea, totally different depending on what studio I go to. But once you have your, your environment and you've established kind of the, the basic world that you want your player to be in, you got to give them something to do, right? You have to give them an activity. You have to give them locations to explore or a point of interest, which is also known as a POI. POI development is another crucial part when it comes to developing your levels because again it's going to give the players uh, an, an area to go to and explore Rome. it's going to give your coders and your engineers locations to put cool quests or activities down at um if anybody here has played destiny 2 or, or destiny or any game like that where they you know you you roam around or you know world of warcraft for another example and you're just you're casually going around. You got a main quest. Skyrim is another one. You're you're questing, right? Maybe you're on your way to a white run to go talk to the Jarl. But then you get sidetracked because you see this this farmhouse off on this beaten path, and there's a, a character just sitting out there. It's like, oh, what's that over there? And you go, and now all of a sudden you're just your brain sidetracks, and then five hours later you're doing side quests, and you totally forget. Oh, I have to go talk to this Jarl, and so. That's that's the point of POIs, right? The point is to not so much take the player away from what they're doing, but also at the same time give them other areas to to explore and not just, you know, isolate them to one beaten path, one location, etc. And so for this POI, for example, um this included a quest hub where the player can go to repair their gear, buy new equipment, maybe some potions, craft new abilities. Um, they can sell items. And then I also was to create a combat POI. Now, the difference between the two is it's in it's in the names. One is for kind of that relaxation, that breather. If you got to get up, go grab a drink, you can hang out in the player hub. Combat POI, that's where you're going for your quest. That's where you're going for the activity that you got to do. Maybe there's a mob over there that you and your friends have been trying to destroy for week after week to no prevail. And finally, you got the gear, so you're going to go back and you're going to do it. That's where, or farming is another very popular term. You want to go farm mobs for items, right? That's your combat POI. So for mine, what I wanted to do, I was really into Blair Witch for some reason at this time. So I want to do some really cool like Blair Witch themed content. So here again, you're gathering references. You're gathering references and figuring out what do you want your hubs to look like? What do you want your combat locate your POI to look like? And so these are just some of the references that I gathered of. I know I want this this hub to be a some sort of the farmland, some very, you know, peasant like experience. They're 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 clearly struggling financially because they're not getting enough from the kingdom afar because of what's going on around them. And that is that this this witch cult has taken over these lands and they're causing all this trouble and the king wants nothing to do with it. So essentially, they just left this this hub out there to defend themselves. And that's where the story elements come in. That's where you're 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 figuring out the story of your world and you're selling that to to your team. And so once you kind of get and establish your, your references, you can then go into taking those references and in a sense, mimicking them into what you want to design for your own world. And so this is kind of what the development stage of these POIs look like, right? And this is where you're establishing your, what's where everything is going to sit. Um, I don't know if you could see it, but this left hand 
this left side image here is kind of a very rough establishment of what I wanted each position where I wanted each position to be. So you got your hub when the player continues through, they can go through the hub and it's going to cross in through some nature and some of the environment and they're going to have some time to walk into the combat space. And that's scheduled to change as it does. And you'll see in these images coming up, this all changes. Like this was just supposed to be an extended dry riverbed, which then turned into a massive river itself, splitting the two in a sense, creating these sort of these islands and you, you start to get these establishing images of what you want everything to set up and look like where you want your, um, where you want your quest hub to be, where you want your, your repairs and your, your, your traders to be things like that versus your combat POI. How do you want to establish that spooky Blair witch theme? How do you want to, how do you want to introduce the player to the location they're going in? And it's all through, you know, selling it in these massive, you know, these windows. So if you've ever noticed, how can I say this? If there's any questions too, um, by the way, feel free to put them in the voice text while I'm talking. Um, I am more than happy to stop and, and talk about things or if anybody's confused about anything. Um, so if you've ever seen an establishing shot, or I'm sure you've, if you've heard of an establishing shot, it's, it's how you introduce a player to a new location, right? It's... <clears throat> It's where you you walk in. If you've ever if you've if 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 you've played World of Warcraft and you've you've walked into the Kul'Tras environments for the first time and you've noticed how you're walking through a valley or you're walking on a path and it kind of has a little incline, like a little hump that you you stand on top of and it gives you just this overview of the new zone you're entering, right? That's your that's your your shot right there. That, that's where it really gives the player the ability to see, wow, I could see something afar in the distance there, like a castle versus, oh, there's a village over here to my close right. I can go on and off path towards. It, it, it's where you can allow the player to see what they're getting into and also really show off the, the scale of what you're creating in an open world or an RPG sense, that is. And so as a final product, you, you, you throw in, you know, from your concepting to your, your, your train sculpting or your block out, that is your basic whiteboard, um, your environmental design, your POI development, and you throw all those things together, you establish this environment, you establish this world for the player to now go and explore. And that's where you get something like this. And so this is, this was a fly through of kind of the final product that one of our principal designers made for me, um, Gary Plazer. He's amazing. It's about two minutes here.
So yeah, that that gives you the overall, the final result, right? But again, that's where... What are we doing on time? Oh, we got plenty of time. That's where I will go back and iterate that it's everything is different depending on what the studio you go to. Not every studio follows the same philosophies or the same principles that you'd see in a uh, design flow such as World of Warcraft, things like that. Um, so there was audio, but it was just visuals there. Um, there's no voice or anything like that. Um, it was just a music background. Nothing too crazy. Um, Michael did have a question. What are your favorite games that inspired you to go into level design? Um, Andrew answered it there. Halo was definitely my inspiration when I was growing up. I have been a huge Halo player ever since Combat Evolved came out. My dad and I, when I was little, we would play the campaign together. But it really inspired me once I got into playing Halo 3 and Halo Reach with their Forge mode. Their Forge mode, you know, if you're familiar with it, it basically gives you these pre-rendered and pre-textured sandboxes and you had an awesome list of assets that you can just place down and make whatever you wanted. You can make cool castles out of cargo crates at the time. Halo Reach amplified that and they give you cool building blocks to really, you know, create these unique structures and environments. And it opened up that door to creativity and it, it started to really set in with me. And, and it really it really opened this door that led into a passion that I found. And I stuck with that passion. And as I continued on, I realized, yeah, this is what I want to do. Um, what programs are, off, are often used in your workflow? So primarily what I use is Unity. Um, this was one that I did. This was just a set dress focus, which set dressing means like asset placement, right? Taking 3D models and textures and things like that that your modelers make and applying them and throwing them in to do a kit bash in a sense. And so um, this is another great example of kind of like how each phase goes through. So, you know, reference gather. I saw this image on Pinterest. I was like, this is cool. I want to recreate this picture, right? It's not so much a level, but just more of like what you would see in a level, right? Like what, what locations would you come across? And I thought, cool, it'd be awesome to come across this cool Nordic longhouse in the swampy marsh environment. So you got your reference. You go into your block out. This one, I didn't do a concept because it wasn't going to be a full level, but just a very basic one still shot of this 3D environment. So I went in straight to the block out, you know, using my reference image as my concept and setting up the camera, getting my basic shapes in the terrain, putting some some very primitive structures and blocks down to really sort of help help set that frame, right? Then you get into the texturing and that material placement. This is where, you know, you're going to start slapping down some grass, some mud. You're going to start putting down your very basic palette to help flesh out this scene and to help flesh out the environment and give it a little bit more life, right? But it's still very, it's bland, right? It's still very dull. The lighting just seems off. The shadows are kind of low. You can't really see any shadows. I mean, the, the texture sculpting here is very rugged. There's a lot of clipping going on here. So it's a lot of, it's a huge work in progress still, right? You're going in now, you start getting more of your your lighting. You start getting more of the post-processing and your additional texturing. Throw in a bit of more grass, add some hues to that grass because it's, it's marsh, right? It's not so much lush green, but there's going to be a couple yellows and oranges in here. Kind of help make that environment pop, right? Um, reduce some of the clipping to help clean up those edges. You start getting your lights in where you want them and some fog. Maybe throw a little smoke up here in the chimney so it looks like there's an actual fire going on, you know, inside and there's life happening. And you come to your volumetric lighting and your volumetric fog. So you start to get more of those cool, spooky shadows that you want in this marsh environment. And you start getting the fog layout. And you really start to create this environment that you almost feel like you can immerse yourself in just by looking at the shot, right? But it's still a little foggy. It was it was too dark for my taste. I didn't like how it really blotched out a lot of the background. So I wanted to incorporate more hues. And this is after getting feedback too. Um, there's a group that I'm in called the Design Den. We'll discuss that later. But it, you know, getting feedback 
with your projects is crucial. Without feedback and without communication and and knowing from others like, hey, this is on the right track, you, you, you won't have a project. If you can't communicate and if you can't take feedback or provide feedback in that sense, you're going to have a much harder time getting the final result of the product or project you're working on. So that's another thing. Crucial feedback is is probably one of the top priorities, I think, when it comes to actually like the, the industry as a whole, not so much just level design, but everywhere you go. If anything, it's more of a life skill to have. Learning how to take feedback on something. But after you get that and after you you've gotten your feedback provided to you and you apply that feedback you come and you create something like this. So now we got more, much more of a cooler color in the fog. You can see more of the background. Maybe there's a little horizon going on or it's the sun is setting. The volumetric lighting is popping with the colors of the light from the flame and the fire that you clearly is something indicated by the smoke coming out of the chimney. You can see it coming through the door, the lighting from our back panel throwing the trees in to create depth in your scene, a little axe and some lantern up here at the front, and even a little light in the very back there, an alternate path going to this door. You, you, you start to create this visual and you create this area that again, that you can just immerse yourself in with it being one single still shot. And now it looks like something that you would find in some swampy marshland. Let's see. Did I have to create all those assets, lights, trees? Uh, those were given to me, Deadly. Um, they, so you're given what's called a kit, right? And as a level designer, at least for the World of Warcraft team, as level designers, we work with the 3D modelers. We work with the textures. You work with the animators. You work, essentially, you're working with everybody. It, it branches down and you're constantly communicating back and forth. And so you're working with them and you get what's called a kit and they're, and so it's a kit of doodads is what the, the level design team refers to them as or assets, if you will. And you take these assets and then that's where you start to apply them to your world. And so your 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 set dressing, which again is your asset placement, you are texturing your environment, you're setting up the lighting, you're setting up these establishing shots and things like that as a level designer. You're not doing any of the modeling yourself but you're you're working with them very closely to make sure that you're both on the same page of what needs to go into what position in in a world or a zone. Um, hopefully that answers your question. How long does a scene like this take for you start to finish? So this was actually a a week project. Um, just because it was the the simple scene. Um, I had already knew what asset kit I was going to be using with this because I had used it in the past. And so it was something where I was able, I was very quickly able to establish my, my kit and set up my scene properly in that sense. And that's not to say though, that, you know, without any technical difficulties that might come up, which they will come up, which is why you save often save, 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 um, or else you will be walking away from your computer frustrated. I've done that plenty of times and it's not fun believe me when you put in almost 12 hours of work and you you crash and then you go back and you uh, reload a save that was only two hours worth of work yeah it's not fun but now this was about a week um and i think another project though one that was more lengthy um and this one is still even unfinished it was just more of like a second pass in a sense uh, this was a Daris. This was a, this was actually my portfolio piece that I had used, uh, when I applied for the internship. This one was actually about a month, um, due to the scale and kind of due to the planning behind this and what I wanted to make. And since it's a, it's, it's more of that kingdom environment and establishing, you know, this, this zone in a sense that's hidden and tucked away in these snowy mountains. So this is about a month and that's not even final product. So depending on your timeline and the scale of a project you're going to be working on and also how many people you have on your team, like if you're just soloing a project like this, it will definitely take you some time. If, if you think that working on something this scale and getting it done and you're three weeks and you're like, oh yeah, it's great. I'm done. 
might be something to get some feedback on and really see if you're done. Unless you're just this absolute genius and super high speed level designer, then it's like, you need to teach me your skills, please, because I want to know those. <laughs> um, are the deadlines for projects at Blizzard super strict and fast? Not really. Um, so the way they did it with was, you know, you're, you're given your, your timeline. And for me, since mine was an intern project, we, we set up a timeline where it was, I had this much of time allotted to be able to learn and be taught the tools, right. For the wow editor and, and create my intern project and then have time left over in the end to actually put a footprint in the game itself. And actually work on something that will be in the actual in the actual game of World of Warcraft. And so it's not so much fast as long as your work ethic is is matching that that scope. Because again, you're constantly going to be communicating with your team. There was barely a time that I can recall where I wasn't in a Zoom call or I wasn't in a um a, a call with uh, another designer or another lead on the team or, an, or a senior talking about my progress on something or talking about the the next steps in my design flow. You're, you're constantly going back and forth. And each day it was like that. There were a couple times um, where there was that communication wasn't as much as other days. But again, you were still talking with somebody and you were constantly looking for that feedback and getting that feedback, that constructive feedback to go and continue to apply to your project. Um, as far as super strict goes, you there is a very clear set in stone. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? The idea, right? The the concept, the goal, the the theme that you're trying to go for, right? And so as you know, following that parameter, if you for example, if 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 you're with the team and you're all you all think, OK, you know what? We want to build a cool Dracula style environment with a bunch of tombs, some blood bowls and, you know, something that make it spooky and looks like vampires. And then you turn around and then you bring something to the table that looks like it's out of um, out of Barty and you make make Mickey Mouse's playhouse. Then yeah, that's not going to be you know that's not going to fly. You want to make sure you're following that guideline. I know weird example, but as long as you're staying in the same mindset and you're and you're staying on the same goal as everybody else is, and you're in your work ethic, you're showing that you you're 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 driven to work on it. It's it's not strict at all. It's not really fast. How big are team member team member numbers? What how big are the teams member number wise at Blizzard? Let's see. So for the level design team, we had, I think it was 13. I want to say 13 or 14. And each size is different, right? Um, I think it all depends on the, the hiring process and how many people they can, each team can hire at a time. When you say there wasn't really a moment not working with somebody are you meaning you were almost always in meetings when did you work on the actual sets oh no you're fine um sorry if that was um confusing there so it's not so much meetings but more so um you you were i was constantly in communication with the senior who i was working under or who was instructing me in a sense my think of it as like my teacher right and or my mentor who was showing me everything and we were constantly in uh voice sessions and these were could be brief 15 to 20 minutes sometimes even five minute sessions where it just be hey how's everything going are you doing okay to hey let's look at what you got so far um let's let's talk about some things that look like they could be worked on some more versus what i think you you can you can say is good and then move on and we had meetings every tuesday that was kind of like our level design meeting gathering. And those lasted for about two hours or so. They were they were pretty lengthy. But it was that was where we showcased everybody's work. Everybody showed what they were working on. Everybody got provided constructive feedback and things like that. On top of those meetings with the level design, we had what were called the design meetings as a whole. This was where 
all of the teams for the World of Warcraft game came together and we talked about what everybody was working on, who was doing what, you know, just kind of showcasing what everybody else was doing since it was since it was remote and everybody was primarily, you know, through it was via Zoom and virtual. That's how we communicated with each other. Um, I would assume, though, that in the studio environment, from the way they described it to me, was that they were always going back and forth. The level design team, that is. They were always, you know, getting up and, you know, collaborating like, hey, how's it going in your in your area here? Hey, what do you think? Can I get your opinion in a second over here on this? So it's, it's always seeking that feedback because you want to make sure you establish that constructive feedback early so you can knock out what you need to get done. And then once you have that all done and established and you're good to go for launch, you you go into it with the least amount of bugs as possible, right? With the least amount of, of issues or the small things that you can, you know, the nitpicky stuff that can be fixed over time. Is the pay at Blizzard enough to sustain reasonable living in that location? Uh, so I was remote working with the Irvine location uh, out there in Irvine, California. Um, and as an intern, so I don't know what the full-time pay is there, but as an intern um, for that time, if it was on site an on site uh, position and not remote, I'd say yes, it was very, uh, very reasonable and sustainable for that location. But yeah, aside from that, that um, that's really what I got as far as the the workshop here so i know because we've got plenty of extra, like 20 extra minutes so definitely cool. open up for more questions i love answering questions do you have any oh do we oh well shoot okay yeah Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Any advice on seeking out and applying for internships? Yes. And that advice is apply. That it like apply because even if, right, even if let's say your portfolio, you've only got two or three pieces. Those two and three pieces are enough. I'm telling you that right now. Because it is not so much on the amount of pieces that they're looking for, but it is it is about your drive. If you are passionate about passionate about what you're doing, right? If you show just through talking about, you know, whether it's it's level design or modeling, animation, if you show that you are passionate and you are driven, and this is something that, you know, it is it's not so much a career at first in your head, but it is a it's just a it's a hobby, that's what they look for. They, they look for somebody who, who is driven, who is, who is wanting to, to put in the work. And so it is not, it's not hard. And right now it's another thing. Um, they just opened up their internship program. It's running up through, I believe until the end of December, but as long as you're a returning student, you can apply for the blizzard internship program and you can go in and it, they have everything from art to animation to modeling, design work, quest design, things like that. And so I would highly encourage anybody here who's interested to at least look into that program. I also posted a program in the um, announce or in the um, promotions and the opportunities in the game design shocker club about the art contest which is another thing too it's a great way to show off your skill set in a bunch of these categories it's a great way to you know look connect with others as well in that sense how would you apply these concepts to fps games that's a great question so with fps games you're not so much looking at the open world online sandbox type of design right you're actually going to be looking at more of a linear perspective or what we call symmetrical versus asymmetrical and i've actually got a project here let's see let's go to my 
So this is the block out that I did for Blocktober um, in 2019. Um, it was a very, very simple block out of Wizard from Combat Evolved. And it, Wizard is a uh, multiplayer, it's a, four, it's a 4v4 multiplayer map, right? And so with this, this is kind of, uh, let me see, there it is. With this, you're you're not so much looking at the the story elements of creating these cool natural environments, but you're you're more so wanting to make sure that flow and pacing in these these locations. You want to make sure you establish, you know, is is this side for red team going to be equal with blue team as far as the flow goes? Because you don't want to create a first person map, right? Or, or a level in that sense where one team spawns with a higher advantage than the other. I know we've probably seen it in plenty of FPS games, and personally, I I I find that things like that are it's it's not fair, and I feel like it's lazy in a sense. I don't feel like that should be something in that level design field. But for first person shooters, it's it's all about you know making sure that you have enough linear space to not have this three second sprint from one side to the other but you want to make it you want to provide it with a steady flow and steady pacing which we can get into flow and pacing in another portion as well that that's a whole different rabbit hole on its own especially with symmetrical and asymmetrical gameplay when it comes to making maps like this this was another one i think this was actually in halo 5's forge editor that i made this was a, multi, a pvp map that i made called uh, emission and so it's a recreation of one of the bridges that you see from the older Halo games, but I wanted to make it like multiplayer base. So you establish, you know, red team versus blue team. It's very, very symmetrical, right? It's going to be, you know, one side, one side, and you're clashing right down in the center. So very small in scale of set in the scale of the map and the flow and the pacing is very quick, very fast. You're you're going into the action right away, things like that. How often were the online meetings? So online meetings with us, so it was weekly for the, the level design meeting as a whole when the whole team got together. So it was every Tuesday. The design meetings were, I think they're every either every Friday, every Friday or every Thursday. I'd, I'd have to double check, but they were they were every Friday or every Thursday. But then the individual meetings where whoever I was working with, whether it was my mentor or if he was out for that day and I, I was put under somebody else's um, leadership, then it was it was almost daily. It was almost daily with the check ins and things like that. I mean, that's that's how rapid you're you're communicating with people. Yes. Uh, so this is actually I have the the pro account for ArtStation. Um, that's with the pro membership. I think that's where you can access the URL to create your website. Um, but I also, if it's something where you don't want to pay for the the pro membership, I highly recommend Weebly. That Weebly is a free URL editor and it's great for building portfolios. Itch.io is another great one for building portfolios. I've got a couple games and projects up on Itch.io as well. So definitely, definitely recommend those for as far as free websites for portfolio construction go. What do you think is a perfectly designed game in your eyes? Ooh, that is a that's a really good question. A perfectly designed game. Ooh, gotta open up Pandora's box for that one. Let me see. Honestly, the a game that absolutely oh a game that abs <laughs> clearly yeah clearly it is pong and just just uh, the two bars d back and forth and just getting so excited every time I heard the ping of the pong ball hit those bars they just blew my mind right no 
I think one game that actually blew me away. Portal. Portal and Portal 2. Absolutely love them. I and it's the reason being is because of if, is how each level is set up, especially Portal 2. When you're working in a cooperative and, and it's that collaboration, that cooperative mode with your other with the other player or your friend where you can either work together every time and you can get to the end right and have that amazing feeling that incredible achievement that milestone or you or your other friend can screw you over during the process of whatever level you're on and you have to constantly restart and so it's it's always that that back and forth and the i think the risk and reward per each level too the the way that they're designed the overall flow and i don't know i think the storytelling through the environment is one of my favorite things uh, you know this 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 lambda science facility that is just now gone downhill and abandoned and ruined and now you're two of these lambda bots that are going through and you have to uh, get towards the end there and i think the story behind it too how it carries in from the first portal is a lot of fun so definitely portal and portal 2 are games that really blew me away one game that is currently blowing me away though and it's not even out yet it's just what they've showcased halo infinite and that's not so much me because of being a diehard halo fan but just the fact of how how far they've really gone with their open world in this one it's just it's chef's kiss right now it's amazing <laughs> also cave johnson yes cave johnson world world building games have a special place in my heart as well and and it's it's you know like games like minecraft because of the creativity right it's i i i, I am nowhere near experienced with a minecraft forging when it comes to these other artists out there that work in that where from the pixel art to the giant castles to the remakes of massive cities. I mean, there people go and rebuild Seattle, Washington just for fun. Be like, hey, you can go and explore Seattle, Washington from a Minecraft perspective. It's like, how in the hell did you do that? Or excuse me, how in the heck did you do that? You know, Minecraft is all is definitely one of those world world building games that sits especially in my heart because of the just the open creativity you can have I'm trying to think what else what else can i can i talk about or show um, dread keep Oh, okay. I guess this would be a nice one. Um, how many people here are familiar with, you know, parallax? Making something seem distant or up close from a certain position when in reality it's just shrunk down in size or scaled up. Is it, are, are people are pretty familiar with that? Because if so, I can go into, you know, when you're creating a, a linear level, right, for a role play game. Um, where, or if you have a game where you are constricting players to a certain play space and they can't just go wander off and do their own thing, I can show you kind of like what I do or what I've done in a sense of, you know, creating that illusion that there is stuff beyond what the player just sees in front of them. And that's actually through this fun, but also chaotic project that I worked on known as Dread Keep. This was my Butler capstone project when I was back at Butler Community College. Castle, just called it Castle. We didn't have an awesome, cool castle name at the time, so it's just called Castle, okay? This was probably the most tedious and the the biggest challenge I had come with, come up towards when it came to actually designing the levels for this game because it's a five-level game, including a tutorial. And I never built a castle. I had never done an interior castle. I had, I had never done any sort of level design like this. This was going to be huge. And it's like, how in the world am I going to conquer this? How am I going to create a castle environment that's going to make the player feel like, okay, cool, I'm in the inside these castle walls, but there's stuff still going on around me. 
And so this is where we've got our, our 2D concept with a legend. Uh, this is when I used Photoshop at the time and I didn't have a Wacom tablet. So everything was done by mouse and that, oh, uh, that's asking for a carpal tunnel. Let me tell you. And then this is the top down of the final product of what it looked like. And you'll notice on the outside, it's very, you know, the very rough terrain builds in the sculpts and the way everything is kind of laid out. Again, it has that framework of the different tiers, the different locations. But as far as the shape goes, the shape, it's, you know, it's upscale. It's different. It's a bird. It is a bird. That's a bird. There's the head, there's the body, there's the tail, there's the little feet. Wow, I'm not going to, I'm not going to unsee that now. Every time I load this project up, I'm, it, it, we're going to call it Castle Bird. There you go. Castle Bird is what we're calling this. What was one of the hardest things you learned in all of your game design training? Ooh. The, one of the hardest things. I think one of the hardest things that I've learned, and it's also something I'm still working on, is not getting caught up in one small section. And that's something that happens to a lot of level designers is if we're if we're trying to make these cool like storytelling elements in our environment, right? We'll get we'll get caught up in it. Uh, for example, the the blacksmith location in my Blizzard intern project that I did, I was so zoned in to like oh i want to put some some metal ingots here next to the the forge and oh put a sword on 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 the on the uh the smithing well uh the the stone here oh i'm gonna put them i'm gonna give them a little table with some food and some ale make it look like you know and i just for i look at the clock and it's like two and a half hours went by and i'm just working on this one small section when i had an entire hub to work on so it uh, you know prioritizing areas to work on and not getting caught up in a small little section of what you're working on is is definitely one of the challenges it was the hardest challenge that i had found and that while it's better now it is still definitely something i've caught myself in multiple times and it's just like oh, i gotta stop doing that i gotta go work on this side because it just it's all it just looks all like mush i gotta make the mush not look like mush and then i can come back and do all the fun details later right but, you know, it happens to the best of us and it'll happen. You'll see it happens to even some of the most experienced seniors or leads out there. They'll still get caught up in it. But for this is like, how am I going to make this framework? How am I going to slap this castle together? And then I realized as level designers, you're also architects. What do architects do when they're doing their blueprints? What do they do when they establish a building? They lay a foundation. So I established a foundation. So you'll see all these different walls and different like cutouts around these locations. And this was my foundation. This is how I was going to carve out the player path and set up this modern castle environment. Where do I want to establish a midpoint that's going to allow the players to see, hey, there's something here, a giant clock tower right in the middle. And it's something that can lead the player towards the next location and get them in there. And so... From there, this was kind of the final product of what it looks like in game. And this is also downloadable. So if anybody would like to see this, um, I can I'll be happy to send you guys a link and you can kind of go in and see all of the 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 design works. You can go and break my game, too. Um, I already had a couple people break my game. It was awesome to watch. But it comes in and, you know, you you establish this. This this castle these these environments where you want to make the player feel like okay i'm about to go through this very cramped this very tight but also clustered castle full of enemies and full of bad guys and that's what i wanted i wanted this to be okay you're this lone you're this lone player with no backup with no allies and you're about to go into this area where it is just nothing but enemies around every single corner and around you is post battle and gruesome gory bits and the the fog of, of you know whatever the necromancer's curse is that's that's casted over this castle which was purple at the time so that's why you see all the purple fog in the emission and right here so the player can come from this little village and go up to the next area but all this background that you see that's all just static. That's not accessible. So it, 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 is, it establishes that, okay, there's something higher up on this tier. And that was something offset to the right. You would see it in the back here, but my draw distance was set to, 
some ungodly fr number that the draw distance would just cut off everything. And I think it was to help reduce the frames and reduce the um, the lag that we had at the time. We are we had a huge optimization issue with this, so that was definitely one of the challenges that we unfortunately didn't um, didn't conquer. But again, here just the creating that that wall that silhouette of the the housing to make it feel like you know there's there's more to this castle than just what you see up front in in the the near site versus the far site having that far site image can really help establish you know a bigger surrounding and a bigger picture for the player uh another great example is counter strike global offensive if anybody's played that it's a it's a competitive multiplayer game but when you go around to these different levels, right, you you can look outside of, of a fence or let's say there's a door that's jammed by a, a truck that rammed through it. But you can look outside that door and you can see there's stuff beyond it. You can see like, oh, that, that road goes on. There's a marketplace back there. It looks like a little vendor, you know, and things like that. It, it helps create the illusion that you're you're not so much in this smaller area, but you're in a much larger environment of its own. Call of Duty does it. Almost any linear game, whether it's a first-person shooter like Call of Duty or a semi-linear game like God of War, that is a great example of near of parallax, in my opinion. They they execute that so well, making it feel like you're just in this massive world, right? And you're really constricted to what's in front of you. It's it's incredible. How long have I been designing games? So for with using actual engines such as Unity and Unreal, it's been since 2016, but using but prior to that, I had actually been doing level design since 2011. And that was when Halo Reach's Forge mode came out. And the Forge mode was again that that sandbox editor that you know, you can pr place primitive blocks, spawn points, weapons, vehicles, things like that, and create your own custom maps that you could play in custom games. That is super popular in Halo. And that that's what drew me into it. Fun f it's, it's funny you mentioned that, Andrew. So if we're really going that far back, Legos were my jam as a kid. They actually still are. And so... As a kid, I was always doing mock-ups of Legos, and I wouldn't so much... I, I would build the set, but then I would also take it apart and build my own stuff. I remember I, I remade levels from the Call of Duty Nazi Zombies maps. I had actually recreated at the time. I, I mean, I created everything from, from Nocturne and Toten from World at War. One of the largest ones I remember creating was Shino Numa, which was a a very marshland style zombies map with four different locations to go to out each door with a main hub in the center and i made remade it all out of legos it was multicolored and wasn't one-to-one -one, obviously but it was just that the the overall design that you could you could look at from top down and go oh yeah that's that's shino numa from call of duty just in legos I mean, so Legos and doing you know making remaking levels or re remaking my own levels from games that was always something I, I inspired to do. Did all the Halo experience help make your training easier? It actually did not. Because while it gave me a gist of level design, I didn't understand flow. I, I, I didn't understand um, proper placement when it comes to that. I was just, honestly, I was just making maps. And it did help me with friends when I would play it though, because they would give me feedback and be like, hey, you should fix this. There's a spawn issue here. Or hey, I can I can run and jump over here when I know I'm not supposed to. So that helped, uh, you know, understanding feedback. But experience and as far as training goes, it, it really didn't start until I hit my first semester at Butler. And I really started learning the ropes when it came to Unity. And then I started looking at YouTube tutorials and uh, world of level design documents, joining discord groups like the designers den, which is a huge collaborative design group where they have game designers and level designers alike who showcase their work and they collaborate and they do events. And so it's always something that 
it's I'm still learning and everybody should still be learning as well. If anybody comes up to you and tells you, oh yeah, I know everything there is about level design. I know everything there is about 3D modeling. I am a guru at animation. They are, they, they, they don't know what they're talking about because nothing, you, you will never be able to know everything because everything is constantly changing. This industry is constantly changing. It's constantly upgrading because technology upgrades, right? I mean, we see Unity and Unreal. Unreal Engine 5 just came out in beta and that's updating, that's upgrading. Unity is updating their content, bringing in new tools. There's Substance Painter, Substance Designer, Maya, all of these engines that we use as students, right? And we use as designers. They're constantly updating and they're bringing new tools to the field for us to use and learn. So we're always going to be learning the tools that we use. And we're, there's never going to be, I don't think there's ever going to be a time where we can say, yeah, no, I know everything. Do you? Do you really? Because... That's where inclusion and that's where diversity comes into. You might not have your skill set, but then somebody else comes and says, hey, this is what I can do. And you're like, wait, how did you do that? Whoa. You can see similarities, but differences. And that's where, you know, you can come together and share your skill sets and combine them and create just these ultimate projects. That is the old school. Let's see to what we see people doing in Minecraft. Exactly. What was that collab group called? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I can get a link here. Let me get an invite link posted. So it's called the Design Den. Really, really great group. Um, you can post your work. You can collaborate with people. You can connect with actual developers and people in the industry from tri AAA to AA. Um, there are people from Blizzard, from Infinity Ward, who make Call of Duty. So it, it's a plethora from 2D to 3D, all sorts of stuff. Where is the invite link? Copy. Boom. Here we go. Oh, well, I didn't. Your personal projects, do you prefer to build your own assets or save time and use other people's? So I prefer to use other assets in that sense. Um, asset development is still something that I'm learning personally. Um, it's very novice. The, the closest thing I think I've done is working in 3DS Max and creating a Forerunner light beam tower from Halo. And I've actually got a 3D model of it now. But I, I definitely enjoy using other individuals' kits and then collaborating with modelers and using their models and things like that, because that's going to help you with that collaboration experience. It's not so much in a sense of like, oh, I just I don't want to put in the extra effort, but it's more of, OK, how can I take somebody's kit and then use that out of the sense of what they're they were aiming for in their photos and their advertisement? And it's also something that you're going to learn, too, with the the industry is not all studios are going to have you make your own assets and then port them into a level design that's just going to be depending on the scope or in the time frame you have for this project that might take up more time than what is actually allotted for it that's why you have so many different teams to do separate tasks that's why you have a three a modeler team that's why you have a animator team a quest design team you know your 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 category of art in design versus your category of software and engineering. And that splits into subcategories for both of them. Game design versus level design. That splits into those two. So it's 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 all about, you know, what your what your requirements are in that position and what studio you're trying to apply for. Like I know, so I applied to Bungie because they had an opening. Um, even though I'm graduating next semester, it still does not hurt to get your name out there and to apply. It doesn't. Even if you get the the message say, hey, we're not going to move forward with your with the hiring or your resume, that's okay. Because now you have your name out there. Some will even tell you, hey, if we find positions that open up in our company that are more suitable to your your portfolio or to your skill set, they're going to let you know. And they will. 
that's that's not something they're not just gaslighting you in that sense they will reach out to you again about that so getting your name out there is probably one of the most important things you can do right now especially as as students and then in the future you never know you might get that phone call and so but their 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 level design term is an incubation designer and that one required a little bit of software knowledge. So learning how to do uh, blueprinting in Unreal Engine while also doing level design because you will do some, uh, you might work with somebody in collab to do some of the, the quest setup or the, the activity setup in your location. Uh, Halo Infinite, I, a buddy of mine who I connected with through that, he was a campaign level designer. He did uh, primarily level design for the campaign, but he also did some of the scripting, not all of it. But he did some of the scripting for different locations in there. And that was from setting up AI navigation paths for the NPCs to follow, um, spawn points, weapon drops, things like that, right? Let me see. I don't know. Invite link. There we go. I sent one. I'm trying to. It, it's setting up, and I, I don't know why it won't. Uh... There we go. Oh, no, <laughs> no. Yeah, great question, by the way, Michael. Great question. I haven't taken any game design classes yet, but are there any fundamental differences between Unity and Unreal? Okay. Uh, I, 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 so are you trying to find out if, you know, if one is easier to learn than the other? Or as far as like what the differences are between like what kind of games each of them make? Awesome question. So, fun fact, originally, um, you know, prior to Unity's latest update, Unity is definitely seen, you know, as more of that low poly, the 2D. It was favored in, in 2D game development, right? And 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 favored in that that low poly stylized esque type of of game design, whereas Unreal had the that HD AAA quality content with the lighting, the the post processing scripts, the the blueprints. Unreal also has a much more easier scripting ability with their blueprint system. It's a very plug and play type of mechanic, whereas Unity using um, C plus or C sharp to code and things like that, and then implement those codes and scripts onto whatever you're designing. Now, though, Unity has kind of stepped up their game with their latest updates, and they've imported a new rendering pipeline called HDRP, High Definition Render Pipeline. And this basically creates that AAA quality that you would see in an Unreal game, but in Unity. And they're actually importing a brand new standard asset pack that I feel like they just took the Unreal bot and ported them to Unity in my opinion, because they look very similar, but they've added a new shader graph system. They've added a new post processing system. They've added a whole bunch of new mechanics that in a sense compete with Unreal Engine, but they're on that same line. I shouldn't say compete in my, but you know, that's the best word for it. 
So they're, they're, they can compete with one another now on that. But games like... Um, so there's a game called Escape from Tarkov. It's a very realistic military simulation shooter. And, you know, it's got those nice high-def graphics. It's very clean, right? That's actually made in Unity. So you can get the same results of a AAA game that you would make in Unreal, but also in Unity. I would say one of the challenges, that did the biggest difference, is, of course, the layout of how everything is set up. The scripting systems are very different. Their terrain system is also very different. I actually enjoy Unreal Engine's terrain system more than I do Unity's because Unity's has a, a, a height value that you can enable, you can look, you can increase and decrease. Whereas, you know, if, if you want to lower, if you want to create a divot or a trench in your terrain, but you've hit your you've hit your height capacity, so you have to lower that and go into negatives, and it's just a bunch of number fiddling. Unreal Engine, now it gives you the advantage where if you want to create a dip or a trench like that, you just have to hold down one key, hold down Alt, and you paint, and now it, it lowers it. So I feel like the terrain editor in Unreal Engine is easier, in my opinion. Somebody else could tell you a whole different thing. They might say the Unity's is easier to use. Again, everybody's different when it comes to what they're doing, right? Um... But overall, I think those are some of the, the biggest differences. I would highly I would highly suggest downloading and trying out both, though. While Unreal Engine is the more popular one in the studios and like the industry world, it's it's definitely the, the more common one you'll see as an editor. Unity is also great too as a tool where if you're you're collaborating collabing or doing indie projects, a lot of indie studios use Unity still. And a lot of even small time little volunteer groups. Um, there was a group called Installation 01 who was actually working on a free Halo multiplayer game where everything was done handmade by them. Models, textures, assets, like the sculpts, the levels, things like that, the UI, the, even the music. And that was all done in Unity. Um, unfortunately, the project has been dropped which is sad, but you can go search them up still on Instagram or social media and you can see all the content that they did and they created some very high poly and high definition stuff through Unity it, and it's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Hello. Hello. Hey. Um is do you think that there's like a high demand for artistic accuracy in game design? Like um artistic prowess, I guess I should say and I suppose in like I don't know, like the ability to perhaps draw 2D and then like uh registering all of that transferring that to like 3D. I wouldn't say there's so much a high demand as far as like the career side of it goes. I know that there are plenty of studios that are always looking for artists. Um, if you if you have a LinkedIn, if you don't, I highly recommend anybody here who doesn't, you go on and you make a, a LinkedIn profile as soon as possible. That is probably the bread and butter and the holy grail to find and see any openings and opportunities to apply towards and follow the studios that you have come accustomed to and that you enjoy following or you enjoy their work, right? Because they are always updating on their LinkedIn. So if you go onto their main website and it shows, ah, oh, they haven't posted anything in weeks, their LinkedIn is probably a different story. And I am constantly seeing notifications from areas like Naughty Dog and their, their artistic careers, or they have plenty of openings from environmental artists to concept artists, modeling artists textures things like that so but as much as like a a high demand and like the skill to be able to apply that in a hasty manner i would say you know it, it all depends on like what position level you're going towards like if you're going for an entry level position 
the demand's going to be there, but they're also going to understand, okay, this might be your first studio experience. This might be your first time getting actual hands on. So they're going to be lenient, but they're also, they're going to be open to teaching you their ways and how they do things in their studio. If you're a senior, if you're going for a senior position, you know, that's going to be somebody with four to seven years of experience under their belt. They're going to be a lot more demanding, like, okay, you should be coming into this knowing how to do these things. We're still going to teach you our fundamentals, but you should be able to bring your fundamentals that you've taken from your past experience at a studio and bring it to the table here. If that makes sense and helps answer that question. Yeah, yeah. I I guess I was <coughs> wondering, like, um, since you do a lot of, like, environmental and, like, sculpting, I don't know if you use ZBrush or if it's all just Unreal uh, terrain sculpting. And if that, like, when you say the word sculpting, I don't know if that is a that is related to like actual like painting and, and stuff oh no so from a, a level design perspective the sculpting is the the terrain sculpting in unreal um i we don't as far as the the level design team at blizzard they don't use zbrush or anything like that that's more on the like the modeler modeling teams side of things they're going to be using zbrush and those modeling scripts and those softwares to do that for their sculpting. Um, I guess I'd say terrain painting would be a better term, but even then that might lead into, you know, the textures and the art side of things for that. Um, which is why I say as a level designer, it's not so much just the design of things, right? You're also, you're an artist. You are a sculptor. You are a storyteller, right? You, you are an environmentalist in a sense. Like you understand how a mountain forms when you sculpt it out of that that um, that terrain model, that terrain plane from all the different divots from erosion and things like that. So it's it's so many things packed into one job that I, I really wish was elaborated more when it comes to like the, the game design classes. But I understand why, because of the the time and the, the scope of the class and how much time is allotted per each semester. So I understand that because it, it just goes on. It's insane. So you said that you had to learn basically like topography and just yeah how erosion works and like how mm -hmm. all these like natural things look in real life and how how do you go about studying that do you just like just google it and try and like replicate it as much as or do you like look up videos or do you go out in real life and like uh, how do you like study that i suppose it, honestly, it's just more like a Google search that that's what they had shown me. It's like, hey, so here's a couple images that we use. And then one of them was a it was a tree graph and it had different elevation points on a mountainside. And it showed you like what type of trees versus like what like the tree looked like the higher the elevation went. Um, and so as you go up higher and higher, you know, the lack of oxygen that can get to these these this life. And so things look a little bit more dead more mellowed out more decayed and as you go up higher eventually there's nothing up there and so it's not so much you're, you're sitting down and you're taking a full class on geology and and things like that but just more of just just go look at references go look at you know google images there's plenty out there also going outside too is another one um going outside and if you're going on a hike i've had times where i've caught myself and i was hiking with my family one time near pikes peak in colorado and I was just looking around and typically to, uh, you know, just a, your typical hiker, man, this is such a great view and take a photo of it. In my mind, I'm going, wow, this would be really epic to put in a level. This looks awesome. Like, I want to sculpt this. It's like, wow, this looks really cool. Oh, I like how that brush is leaning against this, this, this rock wall. I like how the, the pebbles are coming down from where there's a clearly erosion between both sides. Yeah, see, and and it's it's fun. Yeah, look at this leaf. Look at this leaf, and look how it fell into this this little pile of mud. Or look at this look at this river of water that I I used from my hose that I just turned on, and how it's moving and shifting the dirt. You know, it's oh no, lack of oxygen at Pikes Peak. I think I took four steps up a like a nice fifteen degree incline, and I was out of breath. Like I felt like I ran a mile. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> But no, that's kind of the 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 gist of it. You know, you're not so much a geologist of, you know, an expert in that sense, but you just you, you go out and you see what it looks like. Like, how do I how do I make how do I want to make this look realistic? How do I want to make it feel like it's fitting in this environment? 
You can go outside and check it out there. You can go Google images. Pinterest is another holy grail of awesome inspiration and reference to gather things like that. I think 99% of my references are gathered from Pinterest. Um, in terms of like outside skills, um, for level design, uh, I guess, do you like do a lot of like photography or, or, or something when it comes into like lighting and shadows and, and like all the different environments and landscapes and, or perhaps, uh, like there's like the psychology of like leading the player to a certain destination point that looks interesting. So like psychology or photography, I guess, is that, uh, is there like a, a lot of that that's like learned in the game design classes that they teach? Or is that just kind of like stuff that you just kind of pick up by like watching other things that you like, like, oh, I want the player to go here. How am so I it's, it, it's dependent upon, you know, the, excuse me, it's been dependent upon the project that you're working on. Um, but yeah, you, you do learn that that sort of that psychological element of of leading the players right and in level design you can lead the players from either having a modern arrow or you know lighting or na na natural environments if i can find the photo let me i think it's on my we'll find it here uh, i'm glad you brought that up i can point that out here and so i i have a couple examples in my intern piece of you know natural leading elements but also with lighting and so this is a, another example this is kind of your player start this is kind of where the player you know if they're coming into this environment and for the first time on this road and they're like okay well what do i got to do well from and this is from the player stance of like player height so first thing you see in the in the near site is you got a little lantern here with a little fence post but then behind that to the normal player, they might not catch up on this, but as a designer, it'll be very, it, it could be something quicker. They'd be able to pick up on much quicker, but this fallen branch and how it's leading in a sense and that it's leading over is like, oh, there's something behind this berm. But then also to the far site, you've got these branches. You've got this building here, but these branches or these trees are all, some of them are pointing at an angle like this one in the back and they kind of help create that silhouette and they kind of lead the eye towards the objective in a sense or an area of like oh hey there's something back there the lighthouse in the very far side there could help with that as well it's like oh that lighthouse and then as you go more towards the near site and close up you look oh that's that's right there i want to go there okay uh i got can i interrupt you how do you yeah, no, feel, go for it how do you feel about this my eyes were led to the trees in that direct center in the in the background like how would that make you feel that i that i would have as a player went off into that direction as opposed to the lighthouse all the way over to the left i'd love it i would because then that would lead into them exploring okay if they want to go that way and they want to go right into that other biome that environment and that's uh, that's going to be where you know your your combat space is but maybe as a new player you don't know that yet and so you're like oh wait okay there's a lot of bad guys here what's going on like what what's happening and you start you know you farm a bit it's like okay and then that might you know direct you to maybe i should go back here and maybe there's something i can pick up to go and, and figure out what's going on over here or maybe you'll can you will continue on in the path like okay let's go past this that's the great thing about these open world type of games i think that's what i like to call to the most and what what sticks out to me when it creating you know mmo experiences is like the player it's it you can create these areas for the player and you can create these these natural leading, you know, these eye these eye leading points to certain locations. But again, to a new player, they might not pick up on that right away, and so they will just go off and do their own thing. That's what I did. I <laughs> I didn't really follow when I first played World of Warcraft, or when I first played Skyrim. That's a great example. I was I just got out of Riverwood, and I picked up the side quest to go deliver the. Um, the red is it the red guard sword but you have to re, you have to go it's a quest where you have to take this red guard sword 
and put it back in a burial site and you end up fighting this necromancer and so but after that i just kept doing side quests and exploring and picking up new things i realized oh i i i I have a i have a mission i have a main story to do so it's things like that that excite me it's about what's exciting about it is is you know again creating these areas but then letting the player figure it out and also go explore on their own create their own story if you will if that makes sense yeah yeah thank you yeah absolutely well that the structure in the top left corner is perfectly in the rule of thirds this one right here the, oh, thank you, rule of thirds. Thank you for reminding me about that. That was a big thing that they taught us, um, me and Michael, who was another intern at the level design team, was the rule of thirds when it comes to developing a POI and landscape. Rule of thirds, basically, you know, you, know, you have your small, medium, and large objects, right? And then it kind of goes in this circle. And you don't want to have too much of the other, but you want to have that. It's a perfect balance that, again, it helps you combine the near sight with the far sight because as you as you look i forgot how they mentioned but it was something along the like like humans were naturally inclined to look you know like what's the bigger thing and then the focal point it we eventually it lead we lead into the focal point the smaller things the little tiny details um where's another one i had for i had one for lighting what's the poi set up This was the camp. Okay, here's another one. Um, Lighting. Lighting is a big thing when it comes to drawing a player or getting a player's attention to go somewhere. There's a lot of lighting happening here. That's very clear. A lot. Um, Originally, I actually had a blacksmith sign at the top of this building, and it had this cool goblet flame in the middle of it, and it was, you know, bright and awesome. But... I wanted the player, the intent is to push the player to go here, this building, because this is where like your quest hub, this is what I wanted my quest hub to be. So I had this light here, but at the time that big giant goblet fire piece, that, I mean, that was dragging everybody's attention. That's, that's the feedback I got. I was like, well, if you want us to go here, I'm more inclined to go over here because of the fire and the massive light. And so... It's, it's about, you know, how you're going to work that in with the different lighting perspectives and the different hues. And so, you know, what building is going to stand out the most and how you can create that with a height scale. Because originally these were both at the same level as far as ground goes. So even creating a natural bump in the, in the terrain or natural incline piece can really help and go the mile or that extra stretch to really point out a location that you want the player to go to. Let's see. Let's see. That was captain's quarters and like military post. Here's some storytelling elements too. Um, when it comes to actually, you know, c- establishing your your POI or your hub is, you know, there's the story from the quest, but there's also the story from the environments. Which environmental storytelling is also one of my favorite things to do. Because you can you can create this initial story, but then the player can then go in and make a story of their own of what's going on here, right? So for this, I want to make this really cool sawmill. And you know, back in the the original picture, you see these barricades, right? You, these 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 villagers and the, these people are are building up these. They're establishing a, a stronghold, a foothold, because there is clearly danger in this area. But it's like, how are they? How are they doing this? How are they, you know, building up these locations with these planks and and these these boards and all these bits? And so it's like, well, you've got this lumber mill that they, you know, maybe they were using originally to build some planks for ships. Because this is a, if you look at the, like the logos and the theme, they're very like a, a sea hardy faction almost with the anchor and the colors and just kind of their overall, the structure details. And so maybe they were making ships, but now they've turned it into a defense mill. So they need to make and chop down these trees and make lumber to build these barricades and defenses and things like that. And, you know, creating a little work, work, workshop here. Excuse me. I don't know where my words went, but creating a little workshop with a toolbox and some nails on there 
and you know, those little you know, a little light to kind of establish that you can go over and check that out you know again things like that this is the area i was referring to when it came to getting caught up into that one small little section when i had more to work on and i think you can you can tell why again like all these little details here and there of the ingots with the smithing the forge the planks the 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 ale barrel with the table and things like that it, it's those little details that can really really flesh out your game and make it come to life it makes it pop you know and and so that's something that i feel like environmental storytelling if if you if you have such a small timeline to make a game let's say if you're working on a practicum project with a group of people and you want to make a story but you just it's it's not really in your scope right because you feel like it's just going to take up most of the time you can tell a story through the environment through the assets that you place down however you want to place them that's how we did it in our drag keep capstone for butler we took books and we actually put little scripts in them with different stories from different characters that you would have seen throughout the world like there was a, a night in our sewer level where it was a band of five knights and they were going on a mission but they were getting cut off one by one by by these skeletons and zombies in the sewers and you find these books that describe the details of the horrors that they they'd seen and the last book is with the last night which was uh the leader of the five who you find you know tucked away as if he was defending himself for the last time and goes down in a, in a you know, blaze of glory against these evil night zombies you know it's little things like that that are super fun and i feel like it helps you know drive the passion for for game devs in that sense Oh yeah, it's a blast. I think this is one I had a lot of fun with though. This this So this is our, our combat POI. This is where, you know, you're coming from the player hub down this bridge, and I think you'll notice as you come across the bridge is well lit over here with the and defended, but as you cross, you start to get more of that the dark, the fallen leaves of that autumn style. One of the lamps actually flickers. So this one flickers as if it's starting to dim and, and die out while this one is completely out. And it's got, there's a broken glass with an oil stain as if they tried to repair it, but they ran away in fear because something shouted at them or just the, the, the ominous, the ominous, you know, the presence of this area was just so creepy that, you know, they ran in fear of themselves and they ran back to cover in the safety of their hub. Um, and I, I feel like with that, how you display that is, you know, with you're approaching this and, you know, you, you come up and you start to see, okay, we got some bone effigies here. We've got an, a rune stone of some type with another effigy up top here with some candles lit. The roots that are sticking out with the dark color scheme. Your, the red, it, it almost looks like, you know, falling leaves as if like this area is dying because there is clearly something happening with this environment. It shouldn't look like this. It shouldn't be dark and decayed, but you're like, okay, that's where the mystery comes in. And that's where, you know, it intrigues the player. It's like, ooh, spooky, but I want to go in and see what's going on in there. Making lore with props can be really cool multiplayer games whose communities grow because sometimes the community comes up with all kinds of theories and they can make their own lore too. I, yes, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think that's another one of those things that it makes me happy to see when other people go through and they create stories of their own. Because you might have your own visual, right? You might have your own idea of the story you want to tell, but then you could hear a player or somebody else go, oh, I like this. Like, what if this happened? Like, oh, you know what? That's really cool too. Have I ever thought about making a horror game with all this? Yes, I have. Um, I, I've i thought about it and I've had a couple ideas. Um, I've, I've, I've drafted a couple ideas on a Google Doc, but nothing out of you know, solid, you know, final polish yet, but it is definitely something that I've wanted to do is create a horror game using storytelling elements through, through props and kits and environment also 
using the proper horror elements of lighting cues, sound cues, ambience, things like that. Things that truly make a horror game unique other than just a giant scary monster that comes out of a corner and chases you. Rah, rah, rah. Things like that. Um, but yeah, definitely a horror game is definitely in the books to be made. Um, when, or at least the level for that matter, but when uh, to be determined. But this is where you start to come to that approach, right? You you were coming into our combat environment and you, you got a more close up of this this effigy with this blue torch. It's very it, the hue, but then the path that leads up into this area, you start to see the silhouette of a tree doing some weird conjuring and blue magic. But you also get the, these these ruins, these this walls of something a building used to belong here but now over time nature has taken its course and it has taken over this spot now once again and using those torches and lighting to also guide the player inward same thing with angling these stones and doing a slight angle or leading it towards this tree it's like okay there's something in there and also texturing works as well. So making the 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 leaves kind of follow this path where they've been pushed aside in the dirt and it makes it, you know, it gives you a, the idea that, okay, this is a footpath. People have taken this path before. It's active. So now we're going to go and check it out. What advice would you give to a 2D illustrator concept artist for approaching scene design? From your perspective, how similar to similar would you say the process is? I think it's very similar. So concept artists are honestly some of the best designers that level designers can go and collaborate with because without concept artists and 2d illustrators level designers would have a much harder time trying to figure out the the pitch or theme of or vision of their level of what they what they're trying to go for and so with that when you're approaching scene design you know, it's, you're going to be communicating with the rest of your team, but also collaborating with level designers of like, what, what elements do we want to portray in this concept and then take those and then apply them while well, it might not be one-to-one -one with that concept, but it, you could still see those same elements taken from it and applied to a 3d sandbox. And I, I, I think it's very similar in that process. And I, I, I've always been very supportive when it comes to people wanting to do 2d concept and 2d illustrator work because i actually have a buddy of mine named michael cleary he um he's an environmental artist but he does 2d concept work and some of his stuff like i've 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 asked him before if i could take some of his concepts and then create something similar in a 3d environment and that that's what you're doing that's that's basically what it is is you're, you're taking that and then you have the general idea and then you make it into this 3D masterpiece. But you're always still communicating back and forth. And that's, I'm not sure how it would be communicated with a concept art team. I'm sure though it would be a, definitely a lot more of, you know, what sort of tones, what type of, you know, what, what type of theme are you trying to pitch with that? I would assume it's very similar to level design since they're both in that, artistic perspective in that that world design the scene design area i think i have images here oh go ahead sorry I've got nothing else. I was just scrolling through and just uh, kind of trying to find examples for the questions here. The questions have been awesome, by the way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, guys. Um, hopefully, uh, that was something that there was something out of this that could be taken. And I hope that this kind of helps open up more doors to curiosity and exploring level design from that that side of things while also trying to find similarities in what you want to do if anybody here ever wants has any other questions or wants needs um, assistance and getting started with softwares and things like that or if you need help getting started with a linkedin or portfolio or establishing things like that my DMs are always open and you can come and, and ask me anytime and uh, I would be more than happy to help where I can. Because again, this is something where 
Um, you know, it, it's where I want to put my passion and I want to put my time and the game design industry as a whole is something I'm very passionate about. And I am always here to help like-minded game designers when it comes to their passions as well. Because again, we're all, you know, one big team here and it's, it's a team environment. Everybody's, you know, it's diverse as a whole. And so I think that's why we all need to, you know, stay within that, that inclusion and stay. Stay tight knit with that. So yeah, here to help if need be, guys. No, thank you. I I have oh, oh sorry, I have one, one last question for you. Yeah. Um, since uh, we're on we're on like a project together. Mm hmm. Um. So I know that your passion is like completely like centralized around like three D. Right. <laughs> from what I from what you've been showing us. Uh, yeah. Um, so how does it feel to work on like a 2D project? I'm excited because uh, while I a majority of my content is um, 3D in a sense, I have done some 2D work. Uh, they were some mobile games that I've done, but 2D you can you can implement and incorporate a lot of the the philosophies when it comes to level design from a 3D and a 2D just as easily. And so it also opens up to new ideas and new techniques as well that I'm excited to learn. And, you know, creating that that two point, that awesome perspective of draw distance when it comes to a 2D side scroller game and things like that. So I'm very excited to be on this project and actually get hands on with a, with a 2D side scroller type of game. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. But yeah, that guys, was, um that was just something that was like on my mind. No, thank you. Um, this was really fun. I, I had a lot of fun um, showcasing some of the work here and uh, kind of explaining some basics of level design in the sense. So, yeah, thank you guys. Let's 